To go deeper into our episodes, please visit the show notes in your podcast app. Or to get a fuller, unedited experience, go find this episode on spotlightonpodcast.com. There, the notes are packed with links to resources that give you more about the people and topics explored here. Hello, and welcome to Spotlight On, a production of 23 Media Ventures. I'm your host, Lawrence Purrier. Today, the spotlight shines on drummer, composer, and improviser Phil Haynes. Phil published a very unique memoir last November, which includes not only his reflections on a life in and of music, but it also stands as an important document of nearly 40 years of music in New York City and beyond. Phil delivers plenty of inside observations of his work with figures like Lee Connitz, Anthony Braxton, Dave Liebman, and Paul Smoker. But it also includes his own poetry, musical analysis, and philosophical musings and lessons learned along the way. It's a charming book, and Phil has created a towering body of musical work. This conversation is classic spotlight on with an engaged, sincere guest. Listen to our talk and then get yourself a copy of Chasing the Masters, First Takes of a Modernist Drumming Artist. Enjoy. Thank you so much for making time to do this. Oh, it's my pleasure. And it's so nice to meet someone else who loves this music and the arts. Yeah, man, absolutely. I love the book. Well, yeah, I mean, well, we could spend an hour with me blowing smoke up your ass or I could just jump into this. (laughs) You know, it's like Herb Robertson always says, don't worry, we're not like the others. And it could be said for our music, and and apparently it can be said for the book. Yeah. Well, I want to come at the book a few different ways, but one thing I'm I'm really curious about that struck me, so this oddly shaped package arrives at my door, and because I didn't know what was inside, I'm like, huh, this is kind of, I I like getting a big package. That's So what's the, is is there a significance to the form factor of the book? Because as as a recipient, it feels weighty. Yeah, that's an eight. <laughs> I went around and around about this with one of my developmental editors, Nicholas Horner, who's actually one of my prized students at Bucknell. He did all the artwork and he was the one who said, hey, instead of photos, let me do line drawings of these people. We'll get around the Getty image issues. Originally, I formatted, of course, and when I wrote the rent manuscript at 11 and a half, eight and a half by 11, start running out of time. And then there's like, He said, this book isn't a textbook, but he says it could be for some wacko professor like you's class. He says, I'm not sure it's a bad thing. I was trying to do a couple of things with the book. One was it's a nice tabletop thing for a copy table. And then, of course, you could also take it into the bathroom and uh, peruse the, uh, the quotes or the poetry or the pictures or whatever. I really wanted it to be able to serve many purposes. Not very many books come out that are that size. And that's about all the good reasons I have for it. <laughs> well, I, you know, in this era of digital output, whether it's audio, video, what have you, music, ebooks, all the way on through, you know, the trend of like super deluxe box sets and very elaborate packaging, there's something being communicated in the fact that it's a substantial object. It's important given that the life that you talk about your own, as well as the life of a working artist, as well as that period, like the period of your career is really fascinating to me as a student, as a listener. It it parallels my time in New York, my love of music. Your career began at such an interesting time for jazz. I've talked to a lot of guests who either emerged in the 80s or were young adults in the 80s and have gone on to a creative life. There was this idea in the 80s, at least in the listening community, of like, is jazz dead? That was like the question. There were the traditionalists with Winton on one end, and then the avant-garde 
exemplified by maybe Zorn or certainly others in Europe, et cetera, on the other, there wasn't a lot of talk about the people doing the work you were doing, which was it's a modern, vibrant form that incorporates tradition and newness to move forward. That's what I came away with from the book is like, there's a figure here as well as a group of figures that were doing that work, keeping the form alive and modern, not a museum piece. That's enabled what I think of in the last 10 years or so. There's been an incredible renaissance of jazz, jazz influenced music, instrumental music. Could you speak to that arc and any gratification you get from where the music is in 2023? I think when we start off with the weightiness of the book, you know, it's weighty topic and there's a lot of weighty stuff in here. On the other hand, I've always been about, and you make these innovations accessible. Coltrane, whether he was making albums with Ellington or Johnny Hartman or his ballads record, he was always the great ballad player of his era, as well as one of the great avant-gardists who kept on going forward. He was the traditionalist. And those were the kind of masters. Paul Spoker, my mentor, used to say, don't be afraid of the avant-garde. That's the lifeblood for the rapid development of jazz. On the other hand, you got to be able to do everything. <laughs> yeah. Great music. You pick and choose, but you if you're going to be terrific, you need to be broad as well as specialized. There were a bunch of us, when I first got to New York, 83, and I started doing sessions and whatever, those, those first seven years in the 80s, there were white jazz musicians who were very accomplished and making money already in jazz, working in the area, who questioned whether Keith Jarrett and Jack DeJanet and Gary Peacock's standards, first standards record on ECM was the right direction. That's, is that really jazz? Myself, and then quickly within a couple of years, Drew Gress, when we met, we're looking at this like, are you kidding? That's the standard, you know, Gary Peacock and Jack DeJanet. I mean, that's the rhythm team. That's the new thing. We, of course, wanted to be of that, but we had exactly the problems that you talk about. There was a lot of talk about Wenton and his coattails. He had it all, right? Except maybe the originality. Others of us have it all except maybe the business end and the public ability on stage to electrify audiences, that charisma. Certain political figures have it and certain don't. And uh, it's the same thing with performance. It's very interesting. Anyway, I was interested in the important players and the innovative tradition. We all thought of ourselves, whether it was corner store community, all of us, I think, thought of ourselves as jazz musicians, and we were a little perplexed. I mean, even someone like Dave Liebman, one of my teachers and collaborators, he'd say, oh, yeah, well, you you guys are off on your own thing. You know, the, the jazz tradition really stopped with Elvin, Weather Report, and Miles, and what was like, really? I I can't quote him exactly, but that was the gist. And, and I know Ellery and I look like, you got to be kidding. This is exactly jazz. We thought that he would certainly understand Lee Konitz understood. We did collaborative festivals at the Knitting Factory, and he would jump right in with trying to break those barriers between all those communities, the young, the old, the, the known, the unknown, and not everybody does. And maybe the more successful you are, the more you protect your turf. I don't know. But there was this weird thing in the press that we all saw. If you were Wenton Coattails and the new pre-1965 miles, if you were pre that, well, there was a lot of market available to you, particularly if you were of color. And if you were very avant-garde, as you say, shock jock, such as the great John Zorn, well, there was a, an interesting market, certainly in Europe for that. And we found, we, myself, Paul Smoker, Ellery Eskelin, Herb Robert, we all found a market in Europe for about 15 years until the industry changed and small labels started disappearing. But we found an audience there that we did not find. The people in Europe just got it. Oh, this is the new jazz. And the avant-garde people were like, wow, those guys are jazz guys. You can tell they're American. They swing. Mm -hmm. And the uh, American jazz musicians who were 
they say, oh, no, 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 those guys are avant-garde. And we would shake our heads. It's like, why this music in the middle that is so vibrant and clearly growing jazz harmony and jazz counterpoint and interaction, taking Ornette Coleman and reintroducing harmony, not just from a post-African continuum, but also the Western tradition, but with a piano or not with a guitar. Joint Venture was was a great band uh, that did that with Ellery and Drew Grass and Paul Smoker and myself. And when I listen to that music now, 30 years later, it's like, oh, gosh, yeah, it's that harmonic content, as well as the quality of the writing and the originality of the players that was pushing things forward. All you have to do is look now in the last 20 years. Oh, yeah, the musicians all got it. And as I left in the late 90s to come to central Pennsylvania, my corner store community, almost all of them found at least audiences in Europe. And some people like Ben Monder found them everywhere. Everyone has managed to stay as music being their business as well as their passion and their art. And not too many can say that about. I was not unless I was teaching. It was very challenging, but perhaps I left, you know, five or 10 years earlier than I should have, but you just can't tell. I had been in New York for 20 years and I had seen a couple of masters who got bitter and they would vent in the press. And that made me so sad. Heroes of mine, some of them. And I said to myself long before I left, I will never let New York or myself get to that point because it'll be my problem, not New York's problem. But I was starting to feel like, oh, maybe I should have gotten more than I deserve. You know, everybody in their, boy, males in their 30s, watch out, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Especially us white guys, yeah. Oh, gosh, right? And uh, and so the nice thing was that I did get out before I got that dark. And then I found that I could teach it at a college level. And I wasn't good at it. It turned out I was terrific at it. And I had so much fun. And, you know, nobody can take those experiences away from you. And I guess that's the interesting thing about jumping to COVID. When I wrote this book, I wasn't interested in writing a book. And then all of a sudden, you start looking for projects you can do, right? When you're not meeting with people, when the studio dates are all canceled or, or long distance postponed, I realized that the recordings on my band camp alone were jumping three or four decades, and the mastering wasn't consistent. It drives me crazy when I'm always reaching for the volume. One of Paul Smoker's late students says the same thing about, well, when are you going to get the Paul's catalog? I start listening to it. I hadn't listened to some of these sides in 35 years because they came out on LP, and I frankly now realize I didn't have high enough quality LP equipment, neither did Paul, and those albums didn't sound good to us. The yeah. music sounded great. I showed this to uh, a guy in Rochester who does this kind of restoration. He says, you just get me some vinyl that hasn't been played before. Yeah, I've still got some in plastic. Paul still has a couple that came from the pressing plant for approval. He says, that's what I need. I'll take three of them. I'll put them up and I'll get rid of the imperfections comparing the three tracks and I can make you a new thing. Well, when I heard it, I couldn't believe it. It was like, they were actually better recorded I thought, oh, they sound terrific. And then... So you didn't have production masters or you didn't have... No, the because anything? back then we were selling things to companies, right? Oh, that went right. bankrupt in the 90s, in the small companies in the 90s, when there was this big contraction in the industry and then streaming services came out, all that stuff that Awful. conspired against where a lot of us had been able to eke out something. Yeah, I, I started listening. And yes, now we were able to recreate Masters and you realize you're hearing it. This actually sounded just fine. And then the music hits you. And then Paul's playing and the importance that Anthony Braxton always described hits me. And then I start listening through other things, Joint Venture, my band, Four Horns and What, and the, the early trio that Ellery had with Drew and I. And I was like, oh my God, we did what we intended to do. <laughs> and I had always felt, and I know Paul, when he passed away a few years ago, he always felt like, well, we gave it a good run, but we kind of came up short. But of course, our, our goals were innovators, the best of the best, the top 10 on each of our instruments. Not everybody has that arc or that talent or that passion or the 
the influences at the right time in your life. But then I started listening to this music and it was like, oh, we always intended to have music that would age very well, that may have been music of its time, but it was also timely 20, 30, 40 years hence when people could get a better idea of where it might fit historically. And I'll be darned if all of us, even me, I had to listen to myself and say, well, you, you done all right, man. As soon as I realized that I wasn't an innovator the way, say, Elvin Jones was, you know, Irshing or Tony Williams was, but more like Roy Haynes, who was a great sideman. I went on this other arc, and that makes sense. There's other ways of doing things. My favorite of favorite of favorite players are the ones that not only on the records that were famous by the John Coltrane Quartet made Elvin Jones famous, and rightfully so. Well, but everything that Elvin is on, he makes everybody else play at their top five or 10% of their playing output, yeah. the record output. And it's like those kind of players, you know? Yeah. That's how I feel about McCoy. You know, he's on the Freddie Hubbard records or Wayne Shorter records. And it's like, those are all my favorite records by those artists. <laughs> yep. Those people who elevate. And that was part of the fun. You know, when I listened back, I realized, oh, the guys that I managed to record with, yeah, those recordings are close to the top. It was really satisfying. And, and of course, you don't know until you go back and you start listening and you listen with different ears. And of course, I fought depression. And so God knows how much of that was there. And, you know, there's always this crazy imbalance between an artist has to have enough ego to keep going. They have to believe in themselves, but they also can't think they're the hottest thing since sliced bread, or they will fool themselves, right? And so you have to be both your own greatest critic and your own greatest cheerleader, but from a centered, rooted point of view. And it's, it's, it's just sort of interesting. It's like, oh, we were closer than we thought. We did actually pretty good. Yeah, of course, more than pretty good. The music does sound good still. mentioned uh, Lee Konitz. That's an example of someone, like to your point, of sort of like an integrator of multiple strands or multiple worlds and moving between them. And, you know, years ago, I had a conversation with Matt Wilson, the drummer, about his ability to move between what I, I sort of crudely at the time called uptown and downtown. Okay. You know, he acknowledged that metaphor, but, you know, he was like there, you know, it's, first of all, you're a working musician. It's all gigs. I don't know how, how well, if at all, you know, Matt, he's a very well, jubilant person, right? Infectious energy. Absolutely. Personally, and, professionally, artistically. Yeah. And finds the, the excitement and the joy in all the different styles and to, and to do all those, all that different types of work. I, I think of another figure like that, Bill Frizzell, like he can be very far out there. He can also be a bit of a traditionalist, but he moves through these worlds. Something in the book, that I'm also grateful for was the several mentions you made of the original Knitting Factory. Just some of the artists that walked through. I, I saw Sonny Chirac in there a couple of nights in a row in the early 90s. And just, I can't believe I have any hair that it didn't all just fall out from the, from the intensity of it. But, you know, those cut, that room was just, it was shocking. The level of creativity and intensity and like, I don't you know, capital I importance of, of, of that music. 
God bless them. They went on to have quite an empire as venue owners and as a brand. <laughs> but man, that original room, it was something else. Yeah, Houston Street. It was mid 80s and it was already happening. But I heard about it through watching Tim Byrne and John Zorn. They were early people that I admired, even if I wasn't playing with either of them at that point. Then, of course, it's like, oh, well, maybe we can get gigs there, too. What was interesting was there were very few venues to play, and they were pioneers, along with Michael Dorff and Partnership. All of a sudden, there was a home for the music that wasn't like the others. It wasn't just the downtown, although a lot of the jazz I was involved with was lumped into the downtown, and I didn't mind, but I always thought it was peculiar because we were the downtown of the downtown. We were in Brooklyn. <laughs> A recurring theme that you touch on throughout the book is this question of Phil as a sideman or or maybe Phil as not a sideman. I think you were perceived as a leader and not just a band leader, but because you were hustling to make a community happen. I wonder if that played a part in people not thinking you have some as somebody who would sublimate their leadership. Is that ultimately what you think happened? Well, I think it's part of it. It's one of the reasons I took up organizing the, the festival and the musicians at the Knitting Factory and so on was because I didn't have enough gigs and I didn't think this music in that community had enough exposure. And how are we going to get exposure except if we banded together, put on a first-class festival? And at that point, believe it or not, it was still before the Knitting Factory's What is Jazz Festival. There wasn't a new jazz festival in New York City of all places, Right. And so all of a sudden, we'd band together, put up an ad, and sure enough, a few people, New York Times, Peter White, whoever, we start, we would get some press, some ink that it was very hard to get individually. So yeah, there was that. I think the other side was, I have all these skills, but I'm also a type A plus personality, whereas some side men are just the chillest, most laid back people, and everybody gets that. The other thing was when I was a great sideman with whoever it was earlier in their career or otherwise, it was always a collective. And so that's um, a different avenue than just shrugging your shoulders. So sure, whatever you want or whatever the right answer is. Something that Matt Wilson always did seamlessly, effortlessly. Joey Barron always did effortlessly. Tom Rainey continues to do effortlessly. Each one of those guys also wrestled with it. You know, when I got to New York, my favorite drummers, Jack and Tony and Elvin, and really from the 60s and early 70s, and those guys were all huge physical presences in the bands they played. That's not how leaders wanted drummers to play, with only a few exceptions, right? The style I developed with Paul, which was really sort of like when he introduced me to Bill Evans's music and the great basses with him, uh, Scott LaFaro, oh, being able to play counterpoint and being able to play a second line just as important and weave it with whatever the primary line was in a way that's not obtrusive but is also integral, I want to do that as a drummer. Hey, he could do it in 1961 as a bassist. Maybe I can do it as a drummer. Well, not everybody wants that kind of a drummer. Most people certainly was used to hearing Billy Higgins was down the carpet. Drew and I were always like, we want to put down the carpet, but of course we're expected to be able to say more. If you're involved with avant-garde leaning musicians who are also traditionalists, you're going to combine all of that. Well, guess what? That's not always what the people who hire sidemen are looking for. A little too fresh. So there were a lot of things. Just because I moved to New York wanting to be a sideman and never once thinking about being a leader, I had good friends who says, man, you were a born leader. And I look at it and I just sort of shake my head, but then I can see why now. It's that A-plus personality, you know, that type A personality. I work to build collectives, but yeah, I know what I want. I would imagine there's a little bit of a tension there to have your own vision and ideas and will yet be working in a collective context like that's you don't navigate that well and there's a lot of <laughs> a lot of room for uh hurt feelings at, at, at the least you mentioned joey Barron several times in the book 
I have these very vivid memories of seeing him with Masada, just like tossing the drumsticks aside and playing with his hands and, and a big smile on that, that shiny head of his. There's some players that have very unique physical presence when they're playing. I think of as radiating joy. And I think of like a Brian Blade. He just looks like he's moving the music. He's got this physicality to the way he plays. That is, I, I, it's, it's, it's dancing. It's basically dancing. It's, it's really incredible. And I wonder, do you, what do you bring physically? Yeah, that's interesting. Once somebody asked a, a related question to Jack DeJanet, and he said he thinks of his playing on the drum set as multidirectional. He considered the drum set a piano. It was all one instrument. I got that, and I certainly was into that, but I also had come up as a classical musician. And with my collegiate experience, I was doing a lot of 20th century avant-garde music from Stockhausen or whoever. And so all of a sudden, in that context, the percussionist is setting up individual instruments. They really are separate instruments. And well, guess what? That's a very different approach than it's a piano or it's a whole bunch, an array of different instruments, right? I found that I could flip my switch mentally and I could play out of a new music way or I could switch it into a piano way. I heard and felt and related to the instruments differently. Sort of like you're saying some guys, there's joy that comes out, which I clearly have, you know, I'm just, there's always seems to, every, every photo seems to be this big grin, <laughs> like some other drummers we know. And yes, the dancing thing, absolutely. When I think about those two different things, the more contemporary classical approach, that's more like architecture. It's more like a, a calder hanging, right? A mobile hanging. And you're playing these separate instruments and choosing to have them bring the focus up to them or away from them or have them combined. That's one way that I managed to separate my playing sometimes and to keep it fresh as well as doing what Jack had done. Actually, everybody since, what, drum sets started happening when you had the drummers who were on tour in the pre-Vaudeville shows. One drummer was expected to have a bass drum, a snare drum, hi-hats, which are really crash cymbals, and then other things. They started playing it, and some of them played it like all those different instruments, and some of them played it like Jack does as a one instrument. And was fascinating to watch that development. I was able to go old school, older than old school, and freshen up some of my playing, as well as embracing the one instrument idea. That's really interesting. And even the nomenclature, like the idea of a drum kit, a kit is like an assemblage of individual tools, but it's also one tool. You need the whole kit. That's, that's a really interesting perspective on it. I like that. <laughs> Thank yeah, you. It's, it's fun. Well, you're welcome. And it is fun. I can say that to my to my students and the ones who were hip to contemporary classical music, get it like that, and they can immediately do it. And the other ones can make who are used to playing it like a drum set, like a piano, they can get that. But you have to point it out to them. It's a different approach. It's lots of fun. And that's just what we're all about is having fun and revealing new sides to our own aesthetics and our own ability to communicate. We'll be back with more Spotlight On right after this break. If you enjoyed this episode of Spotlight On, please share us with a friend and leave a review or star rating on your podcast platform of choice. Thanks. And now, back to Spotlight On. There's a sense of wonder that permeates the book. I think you're taking the reader on that journey of rediscovering the music you made and realizing that it's now a body of work that's contributed to the form. There's also a, a very fun strand of humor throughout the book. There's a few pages in particular, about a quarter of the way through, grouped under the theme of like the cost of pursuing art or the, the cost of a life in art. Yeah. That I found so poignant and really impacted the way or the lens through which I saw the rest of the book. And when I was feeling really, I don't want to say like down, but I was feeling a lot of like empathy and sadness for the difficulty of that life and all that it entails, if you're going to be dedicated, right? Like if you're not going to be a dilettante. 
I actually laughed out loud. I have to read the quote to you because it broke up the tension for me. There's a Casey Stengel quote. The secret of managing a club is to keep the guys who hate you away from the guys who are undecided. So I was reading in bed next to my significant other and I laughed out loud and she said, what, what? And I read it to her. She just shook her head. That's like the biggest life lesson I've got in a long time. And, and I came across that quote during the time I was writing it. So just a couple of years ago during COVID. And I almost spit up when I read it. I got to that punchline. It was like, for the guys who were undecided, it's like, oh my God. And it's so hysterical. And it is. It's poignant. It's true. This music, obviously, it's a combination of European traditions and world traditions, but really African traditions. And what, where, how did they, they came as slaves. They were forced, right? A lot of us, if we had gone through that kind of life, our music probably wouldn't have been all that positive. But somehow the blues and other forms of this music that came out of the post-slave experience always has this hope always sees the joy, as well as acknowledging the dark. We sing the blues to make ourselves feel better, as well as to process. We sing gospel to praise the Lord, as well as like, oh, we got work to do. That is an amazing gift that I suspect is largely African. Man, it, it is amazing. I think about the one-room schoolhouse, the whole idea of there's one master drummer, and then their job is to bring this whole community of percussionists together, including the three-year-old. Can you give him a cowbell or something and then something integral to do that you are helping them on the path to maybe becoming a master drummer or just rising to their potential, right? And where everybody plays with everybody, if you're serious enough and we recognize that, oh, you're one of us, you might be one of us and to include people and it has great advantages as well as some disadvantages versus the European, like, oh, you we're going to group you by age and development and physical and what height, whatever. It's like, wow, no, no, no. We're going to put everybody together because we need the diversity and we need the continuum. The old cats need the young cats for different reasons than the young cats need the old cats. That is an amazing thing. As an educator, have you ever worked with young children or in elementary grade or younger? Or have you ever done workshops or any kind of education work with kids? Elementary, yes. You get beginning drum students very often, fourth, fifth, sixth grade. Maybe their parents will allow them to, to take a drum lesson as well as piano lessons or whatever. So yes, some, but most of my students, even the ones that I took for five, six years started in seventh grade or so. So yes and no. I would say mostly not, except that there's these noticeable exceptions. Yeah, yeah. What are you driving at there? Well, I think two things. One, I always think of drummers starting just a shade older than other musicians because they have to wear down their parents to allow them to act. Like their, their parents want to see if they could outlast them and maybe they give up the drums. But more importantly, the idea that, you know, if you give a child two blocks or two sticks or a drum or a tambourine, like they'll have at it. And that to so sort of to mirror it back to your notion of like the group, the community the education or the master and student relationship. I can just remember as a child in the 70s, getting the two little woodblock sticks and being in a room full of kids. That was early music education. The idea that you're doing it in a group of other people, not one on one instruction. And I, so I, I was just curious about your experience of, of like being in the middle of that creating that flow. I would say that I would have worked with more really young students. And maybe that's one of the next things that's coming in my life as I am in my 60s now. Maybe when I start uh, volunteering more in the community here in central Pennsylvania, maybe I do need to, to look at kindergarten and uh, early grade school aged kids creating not just drum quote unquote circles for them, but building off of that, you can make anything into an instrument and play avant-garde new music, and you can teach the same fundamentals. It's like, well, imitation is okay, but it's more interesting to do a concentric circle that's complementary but contrasting. You have a chance to build depth 
and expansion of these ideas if we think of concentric circles. Even though Herb Robertson doesn't talk about it in words, he just does it. There's Phil Haynes before meeting Herb Robertson, and there's Phil Haynes after. And he, he did. He was like, oh, that's what free playing is. I've been labeled a free player by a lot of people in the press and some musicians in New York. But then once I was around Herb's, oh, no, that's free. And I was able to teach it, as it turns out, in college to my students. And I didn't allow very many jazz musicians in the ensemble, but classical musicians who were needing to learn how to improvise and those who could abstract from all kinds of traditions, whether it was visual, an artist, or a dancer, or a poet, we could combine all these elements together. My wife just did a music program at our local little UU church. It used to be the holiday music program. Well, this year, it not only had music from the oldest to the youngest in it, but it had a juggler and a little girl who was doing early gymnast stuff. This is how you get community to grow, right? It's such a simple thing. Oh, no, it's, it's a holiday program instead of a holiday music program. It's an arts program. We're going to have fun communicating. And this is something that I do know how to do and I'm pretty good at. Yes, you have to start them young. I've been reading a few different things that people have been posting about, oh, I wish I had been introduced to the instrument this way. And of course, improvisation is a lot of it. And listening and asking the student, how do I get it to sound more like your pitch? You know, all these questions come out naturally instead of this is how you get your intonation. No, you have to do this. All right. It's have them asking, right? And I always remind my Bucknell students, it's like, I can't teach you anything, but I can help you ask the right questions. Once you ask the right questions that you need to answer, I can help you find the right sources. I can help you find primary sources because you're going to teach yourself. I can't teach you anything. Nobody can teach you anything, but we sure can help you. I thought once you're on the right path, <laughs> this is how you get, this helps. <laughs> I wanted to circle back to Paul Smoker. There's clearly lots of things in the way you depict him that sound very intimidating. <laughs> but, but one of the things that, that I came away really sort of taken by was his ability to be a very deep listener and then to communicate or comment upon what he was hearing in the music. That's something I admire greatly. I'd imagine it only comes with a tremendous volume of listening. And I don't mean, you know, sound volume, it's just a copious amount of music coming in, but also having the sort of academic or intellectual background to synthesize it all, but just incredibly powerful to be able to hear the thing that needs to be commented on. Yeah, it really stood out for me in the book. And I, I wonder, have you been able to cultivate that ability? Paul and I, I, I shared a lot of his traits. We connected both because we were a lot alike and because we were a lot different. He was absolutely a lead trumpet player, Taurus the bull, alpha male, whereas I'm a Gemini. And so I can, I'm twins, you know, I can do, I can go either way, but I'm also a type A personality. So I think he always thought he was a little shorter than what he actually achieved, which is what Braxton said. No, you're a reconstructionist. No, Paul, you're an innovator and you're helping people jump from Freddie Hubbard to the new music that we now all hear everywhere around us, whether it's Nate Woolley or Thomas Haber or whoever who's doing the new music. 
he understood clear back in the 80s that Paul was a missing link. Paul did say to me before he met Braxton, hey, man, I probably did okay. What I did okay is every kind of music there is for a trumpet player in America to play, I did professionally. I did it at a really high level. I played it all. He says, you have to know all that music in order to be broad enough to have enough scope so that then when you start putting things together through yourself, you have something to say that is like more likely to have some power and some value to people in the future. Mm. And so he had that. And it was interesting because he talks later, somewhere in the middle, middle late part of the book about playing free and how it's dangerous. And I ran across that interview because he had never said that to me, but it was like, it was so cool that he figured out, yeah, there are all these issues with playing free in an ensemble, let alone yourself. And it's like, can you get good at that? The other thing he would say, isn't it interesting? You know, we, we would be over at the MERS Festival with, uh, say, Four Horns and what, my, my, my quintet, and the band, it doesn't matter who it is, but a very famous black band assumed we were stagehands and asked us for Cokes and to get some cognac. And then we walked out on stage and we played our set and these guys all were like, this is because we opened for them. They could not believe what they, and they were embarrassed. And it was clear, so clear. And Paul afterwards, we finally get, gets a beer in front of him and he says, isn't it funny? I know all their music and they don't know any of mine. Mm. He says, they don't know any of ours, but after today they do. And that was always the thing. It's like, you have to know all that music and nobody can know everything, but he knew a lot of it. He was able to communicate it deeply. Ellery Eskel and I meet, and he comes out of the opposite tradition where he grew up on the street musicians in Baltimore and Philadelphia, and nobody in the older generations ever talked about the music that just happened on stage. You were supposed to learn by osmosis. Whereas Paul taught, we talked all the time about every performance and we listened to it together and picking it apart, not looking for patterns on the back. No, how do we get this better? How do we make it more consistent? How do we communicate better? And what it really came down to is, oh, you know, there aren't three, four, five set gigs anymore for a week at a time, 50 weeks a year. Yeah. We can't do it by osmosis anymore. If we don't figure out how to talk about it, there's going to be a lot of people left out that otherwise might be able to get this or get a lot farther down the road, closer to their potential. And it's all any of us are after, right? How on this quest, what can I find out next? Because the more you know, the more you got to know. Yeah. <laughs> well, in so much as the book to me also, it sort of stands as like the stating of a case. This is me. This is my work, my lineage, my group of people, my comrades, my peers, my scene. It's an important document of all of the above. Something that really struck me at the end of the book was, you know, your struggles during the pandemic and coming out of the pandemic and like, who, what, where am I now? I wonder now with the book done, you've been talking about it now for probably a couple of weeks or a couple of months. How do you feel? Do you feel like you have a direction for what's next for your work? The answer is yes. And something I didn't have, as you say, three years ago, when you have a chance to reflect and then you've got enough decades where your ears have grown some more, all of a sudden there's new perspective. I both was able to feel much better about what I had accomplished in my career after looking at it for the last three years that all started with looking at Paul's career first. And then I had to look at my material too. But then it's sort of like, oh, one of my developmental editors asked, well, okay, well, so now what? And it's like, hmm, that's a good question because I started off with raw physical energetic expositions, right? Whether it was with Paul's trio or Four Horns and what. And then after I did my solo record, after I met Herb Robertson, I realized oh, I need to be able to play all this stuff acoustically so that nobody needs amplifying on a stage, right? Because we're playing small venues, we're playing one room recording studios. That led to more refinement. The music always is both raw and very refined, but one or the other. And I would say in the 60s, it was mostly raw. 
And then from the 70s forward, it's been mostly refined, mostly, right, by most bands. Paul's trio in the mid-80s and Ornette Coleman's primetime were real outliers. It just shows that there was a, well, I look at my career and it's like, oh, I got really good in the last 25 years out of making three approaches consistent where it wasn't inconsistent improv. It may be dangerous, like Paul would say, but I can do this. Whatever the first idea is, I can develop it. I know how to group a whole bunch of things in a mobile, a whole bunch of movements. But then there was also sort of like, oh, I miss that visceral thing. I miss, and it's like, I can give myself permission now after all these years to play a little bit more out of my physical, emotional, worry a little less about development and just see if you can get back to that childlike intuition. There's probably a couple of contexts, not all of them, because I am a sideman, but there are certain projects coming up. Ben Monder and I are going to do, we used to get, get, get together at the corner store all those decades ago go in Brooklyn, and we'd play one tune, Coltrane's Transition, a couple of versions for an hour, and then we'd go up to Joe's and get eggplant baconzini or a eggplant uh, parm heroes, eat, chat some more, and then play the same tune over and over again. And we did that about once a month for years. Well, we never recorded it. We're going to go do it as a duo. Yeah, pull trains transition four different ways. So there's certain places where, oh, it's okay, or I'm with certain players who like that kind of physicality. And so I'm giving myself license. I think... That's what I need to do because, oh, I've been more refined for the last two thirds of my career, whereas I started out more firebrand. And it's like, see what happens when you try to mix more of that fire back in. You know, you, yeah. life is not only playing piano trios with, with basses, with great sounds who don't use an amplifier. I, I love the idea of a late period fired up fiddle. It could happen. <laughs> Something that surprised me is, given the era and the scene, I would have expected you to have played with Zorn. Yes. You seem like the kind of drummer he would like. I'm not sure why it didn't happen. We met pretty early when I was playing with Paul's Smokers Trio with Ron Rehobit, and we met at the MERS Festival. He was playing duo with Arto Lindsay at that point. Mm -hmm. It seemed like there was an obvious connection. Anyway, I painted houses with this drummer, and he says, oh, yeah. Zorn, man, he talks about you all the time. I said, me? He says, well, you and Paul Smoker. I said, what do you mean? He says, you know, I went to him and I said, you know, Zorn, you've got the most intense music on the planet, man. I'm so into it. He says, no, 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 you don't know what intensity is until you've heard Paul Smoker's trio live. Wow. He says, Phil's too much drummer for almost everybody. You don't get many reviews that are that candid very often. Of course, it comes through the back, the back way, but it was direct. So yeah. no, it didn't, it didn't happen. And partly is my fault, just like the rest of the scene that was more traditional, it would have seemed like I would have been a good match for, I had those skills. I wasn't a hanger because it cost a lot of money to hang, right? If you went to the Vanguard or whatever, and even the third set, you said, you know, it's, there, there were just, it was 25 to $50 every time you walked out, right? Yeah. Out the door in Brooklyn and went into town on the subway, whatever. And and then there was the thing about when guys came off the bandstand, they wanted to be complimented. It took me a while to learn from people like Anthony Braxton, you can find the one true thing you can say about them, whether 
they were your cup of tea or not, right? You can find something very true, even if they're not your thing. But boy, it takes work to find <laughs> that thing that is so earnest and so true about them from you. I wasn't a hanger because I didn't want a glad hand. I didn't want to be perceived as that. Well, there's a whole scene and you're spending money and I, you know, it's like all my money was going into recordings and living in New York. It's just interesting. It's like, oh, but that's not how it's done. It's a community thing and you have to be seen and be on the scene. Just dance this way, right? But it doesn't mean the two of us might not find a venue to play together in the future. Well, that's what I was going to say to you. You're talking about it was a missed opportunity, but you're both uh, alive, well, and and still vibrant. <laughs> yeah. No, it's a great idea. Somebody said to me, oh, you need to do more of the Braxton thing. You need to do more of the Art Blakey thing. And I said, come again. Because you need to hire really young people. They work really cheap. There's a whole bunch of them that can play anything that you can write. And they need you and you need them. And it's sort of like, okay, name one. Because, of course, I'm no longer in New York where I can filter them through the corner store and all the jam sessions and the duet sessions and whatever. I have found a couple of people, and we'll see how those go. But basically, it's not easy. Their reaction is, well, what's he want to play with me for? It's like he's already played with this person, this person, and this person. That's interesting. And so it's like there's a double disconnect. But you never know because every once in a while you play with somebody. Anyway, all that's made me go back and say, oh. Frank Lacey and I only recorded once together. We always had great chemistry. Oh, somebody like John Zora and I never recorded together. We should think about it. Let's throw this up and see what happens. Ben Monder and I didn't record together. Now we're going to record together, right? I just saw Ben Monder earlier this year with uh, Maria Schneider, and uh, he's just... He's always been like that. He's just more. Of course. Incredible. Incredible. Unbelievable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Thank you so much. There's so many things to thank you for. A lifetime of music, a terrific book, and of course, the time you've spent with me today. I very much appreciate all of that. Did we have some fun? I think so. I mean, come on. Two handsome guys like us. I'm telling you. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't lost all of it yet, baby. <laughs> well, I, I'm glad I touched you, and I'm glad you reached out, because... I feel so good about the book because I feel like I got it about right. This was before people started interviewing me. And I think I got it about right, even though I never went out to, to write a book. And now you see the reactions. I wished I had had this book while I, when I was a student that I was reading Chasing the Train, when I was reading Miles by Quincy Troop, when I was reading Beneath the Underdog. Oh, because a bunch of the stuff that's in my book wasn't in those and wasn't yeah. anywhere else I found. And yet there's a bunch of breadcrumbs that I put together that any creative can use to get a lot closer to their potential and a lot closer to the masters, whoever their masters are. I agree with that. And I, and I appreciate it as a document of a very important time in the music that is still being reckoned with, has not been incredibly well documented. For all the major figures and supporting players, there's a lot of work to be done there. I try to do my part with this podcast to talk to as many people as possible. But I think that the book fits nicely in that part of scholarship as well. You know, we used to look to the left and the right, you know, whoever was in that community. It's like, okay, we loved the bit of press we got, but how come it's not more? You were competing with people who were getting Grammys and their music wasn't as serious or moving the tradition forward, even though it was making money for some people, usually the big labels. <laughs> and it's like, yeah. why isn't there more? I mean, some people get it. Well, now, as you say, uh, and Gephard Ullman says this, and I think I quote him somewhere in the book, you know, it's several decades later when you find out the difference between a really good record and a great record. That's true. You know it's good at the time, but does it last? And I love that when Miles was poo-pooing Ornette Coleman and Coltrane was about silent but completely transfixed and Leonard Bernstein says, yeah, well, you know, Music's more likely in 50 to 100 years to sound like Ornette descendants than Miles descendants. It's kind of funny. It's like, I don't know why, but it's like, it sure looks like it's shifting that way, even though Miles is huge. And somehow, Liddy, he always saw big pictures, and by God, I think he's turned out to be right. But it takes time to catch up. 
all of us, right? Thank you so much, Phil Haynes, and to all the masters who inspired him. As always, thank you for listening to Spotlight On, a production of 23 Media Ventures. I'm your host and executive producer, Lawrence Purrier. We're produced and edited by Michael Donaldson, and our theme music is by QBurn's Abstract Message. If you'd like to support our work, please rate and review us wherever you listen to podcasts, or visit us online at spotlightonpodcast.com. There you'll find our free episode archive, weekly postings on our official blog, and a ton more. Thanks for listening. Be safe and stay in touch. Thank you.